Welcome back to the COG Weekly Podcast, Season 4, Episode 1. Yes, we are back with Episode 1, and we are so excited to be back with you guys. We took a three-week hiatus from actually posting on the podcast, but that doesn't mean we stopped working. We worked tirelessly to try to get interviews for this coming season. So keep your eyes peeled for all of those interviews that will be upcoming. And in today's episode, we have an interview for you guys. So we're super excited to bring you guys Cody Roberto, who is a professional footballer and the CEO of a company who has a lot of great messages and stories. So make sure you keep listening so that you can hear all of those. Yes, but before that, we have to, of course, go into the Hassani of the week here and also predictions and then we'll get right into the interview so let's pull up the hasani of the week uh there it is there they are. We, we do have <laughs> we we have three players yeah. for you guys as always we're starting season four off well but because european football has sort of died off it, it's not happening right now yep. as you guys know the season ended about a month ago similar to when our podcast sort of took our hiatus so we don't really have any European players that are playing. There's a lot of women's football going on right now and football in the United States, such as the U.S. Open Cup, some MLS games, and then also some USL Championship games, which we will touch on. And then in over in Europe, we have the women's games and then also some under-19s football from different, uh, in the U.S. and, and in England, yeah. I should say, from, from different countries and whatnot. So, um, yeah, the selection is much smaller. But we are still excited to be bringing Hassani of the Week to Season 4, Episode 1. And we think it's only right that we do it, even though top-level football that we normally cover isn't happening. Yes. So starting from left to right, I would say. Left to I, right, I'd say that, yeah. that's something we do more yeah, frequently. Yeah, yeah. Starting on the left, we have Quinn Sullivan, who is U19s, or U20, I should U20, say, yeah. U.S. Youth National Team. It's kind of weird that the U20s is still youth because they're technically adults. They're technically, yeah. But it's, but it's under the umbrella. <laughs> yeah. Youth. Yeah. And he had a really good performance. He did. He had a first half hat trick um, against Cuba uh, in a 3-0 three, three win. So he had the only goals in the game. And the first goal was actually assisted by none other than Caden Clark. It was. Interviewee of the podcast. And a uh, very good goal. Caden had a very nice cross into him. And then the other goals um, were also well taken, good finishes. Um, but yeah, I thought the the team is actually playing quite well in their games i don't know if you've uh, watched the other games against canada um and the other one where they won like 10-0 didn't they um but yes sullivan did very well first half hat trick is impressive for any level um and then the second player is chuck wameka from the england u19s who has three goals in two games uh one versus austria and two versus serbia and yeah, I mean, I I don't know if the U.S. U twenties would match up against England's U nineteens, but I don't. What do you think if they played each other? Well, I think we do have a solid squad. I think yeah. we have some players, you know, Paxton Aronson, who, first off, Young Americans Abroad is covering this tournament very well. Yeah. If you don't know already, Young Americans Abroad is an Instagram account, and they're posting all of the U.S. highlights from this U twenties tournament. So go to their Instagram to see them. So I've seen Paxton Aronson is doing very well. Caden Clark, you know, he got a goal in the first game. And then, like you said, he got the assist in the in the game more recently. And I do think that overall the squad looks pretty good, but I don't think it's comparable to in England. I think more likely our actual national team and England's national team are more comparable. And we That's will true. see we will yeah. see that matchup in the World Cup. We will. But uh, I don't think that our youth 20s are actually as comparable, which might be a problem considering that's the people that are going to be, uh, you know, it, it, the evolution of the national teams is naturally yeah. the U20s eventually will be the players in the first team. Although that doesn't always happen because you have people that slowly tend to find their way later on in their career. But still, I think that uh, we we are lacking some sort of development in, in that area. I don't think we have quite as strong a, a youth national team right now, just in my opinion, mm -hmm. as some of the other countries that we might want to be fighting for. Uh, with with spots uh, sort of in the FIFA rankings in the coming years, but yeah, overall I, th I think we have a good U20 national team. Quinn Sullivan did a very good job, and and Chukwemeka also did a very good job with three goals, like you said, for the the England U19s. So I think overall it's good coming from both sides. You you the youth looks good right now. Yes, it does indeed. And then lastly, Preston Judd from the LA Galaxy two team uh, scored a hat trick versus Monterey Bay. 
um, in their USL, right? USL championship. USL championship. So, uh, yeah, just three players with three goals. It's quite yes. impressive. But... Pre Preston Judd, he had a very good performance. I find it interesting that the LA Galaxy are playing their second team in the USL championship as most of the second teams or reserve teams if you're from Minnesota, you will know the Minnesota United team does this, yeah. plays their reserve team in the MLS Next Pro. The USL Championship is actually a step up from the MLS mm -hmm. Next Pro. It's technically considered second division in the championship, and the MLS Next Pro is considered third division. So their team is playing at a higher level, but I do find it interesting that they're, for one, allowed to do that, and for two, that they do that. But they do well every single year in the USL Championship. They just don't get the same revenue because... It's harder to bring supporters in when you're a second team of a club. Yeah, exactly. Than if you're in a smaller area or even a large area like Sacramento uh, with Sac Republic and, and they just have a larger following because it's it's the first team. It's the biggest club that they have in that area. Yeah. And so what do you think? I, I'll go first for who I think should be the Hassani of the week. Uh, personally, I'm going to go with Quinn Sullivan as a U.S. you know U20 player, I think. First half hat trick is even more impressive than a hat trick in general. And then also to do it um, in, you know, this CONCACAF kind of battle where there's very good teams. Canada held us to a 2 2 draw last game. So I think he did quite well. And I think he's deserving of the, of the award. I would actually 100% agree with you. Really? I was going to say Quinn Sullivan as well. For me, it's between Chuck Womenka and Quinn Sullivan. Yeah. I think even though they're in the youth national teams, uh, you know, that setup. I think it's more impressive doing it at a national level than at a USL championship level. If you look at players that are in our U20 national team, a lot of them are playing in the MLS currently. Yep. So playing at a higher level than uh, Preston Judd for LA Galaxy 2. So I, I think it's it would have been between Quinn Sullivan and Chuck Omenka, And I think I give it to Quinn Sullivan. I watched his goals. They were really good. And I, I have to support the USMNT. I know there have shouldn't to. be bias in here, but you have to at some point. To. Like there, <laughs> yes. You have to give up something. Yes, exactly. All right. Uh, I mean, as far as scores go and ratings, I'd probably, um, you know, if we're comparing to last seasons um, where we First had, off, we don't have the rating screen up. Yeah, we don't. It's it. It, on the rating screen, it said the top three and bottom three from season three. And so we don't feel like it's right to bring season three into season four. It's a fresh start for everyone. For all the footballers that are trying to get on the Hassani screen, it's a fresh start. Yeah. So we're not bringing in the rating screen. So we're just, you know, doing it from a clean state, slate. But obviously, we're going to have our our rating system sort of skewed by what we did last year. Exactly. Keeping and, the same setup. And like you said, it's in the summer, the off season. So, you know, maybe these ratings might be a little lower just because the competition is not as high. For Sullivan, I'm thinking more of a maybe a 6.5 for me as you know the lowest last season i believe were like seven point i think seven was like the lowest yeah. although i don't know maybe it was a 7.5 it might have been Somewhere raheem sterling's there. hat trick versus norwich yeah and Somewhere so around there yeah. i i think like you're saying it has to be lower yeah than a raheem sterling hat trick versus norwich i mean you're looking at a premier league level player doing something that Quinn Sullivan did, but not Quinn Sullivan's not at the Premier League level. So you have to lower it a little bit. Yeah. I would even go a little bit lower than six point five. Not to knock him and what he did, it's fantastic, but just in comparison to what we were saying last year, I would say that this performance gives a five point five. Okay. Yeah. And so if we average that out at six, I think that's respectable. A six, yeah. It's technically speaking the lowest rating we've ever give <laughs> given, but it's hard. We're not in top level European football right now. So you can't expect players to be performing at the same level. And when they do put out the same numbers, you can't praise it quite as highly because they're not doing it against the the, the highest level of competition. Yeah, exactly. If the World Cup was going on right now, it'd be a different story. It would be. It would be quite different. But <laughs> Uh, I think that does it for Hassani's. Yes. Congratulations, Quinn Sullivan, yes. for winning the Hassani of the Week Season 4, Episode 1, with a rating of 6.0. Congratulations again. And we will make sure to put that on the COG Weekly Instagram. Mm -hmm. So again, like I say every time, if you see it, you can you can feel... You don't have to be humble. You can repost it and, yeah. and everything <laughs> and maybe maybe Just share it, it a out, little bit. Put it <laughs> out there. Why not? Uh, but before we, we move into the interview with Cody, which you guys are going to want to stay for, we do have to do our predictions. 
which are three games always. We have our all-time records. Mine's not quite as flattering as I'd like it to be. Not quite, but it's a fresh, you know. Season, if you look right below the all-time area, there's a season four area, and I think we're tied right now. Nil, yeah. nil, nil, nil. So I don't see any problems with it's that. It's nil, nil. So uh, first game, though, is LA Galaxy versus Minnesota United. They call this one the Chase Gasper Derby. They do. Everyone I mean, does. he's been he's yep. been at both clubs. Yep. Everyone knows the stakes. Everyone knows how important Chase is to both teams or has been to both teams. Exactly. So it's really a big game. It, do you think Chase will play? Uh, so when they played at Minnesota like a month or two ago, he subbed on. Um, and that was quite recent after he got transferred. So I don't know really if he is starting or in the rotation uh, these days, but we sure do miss him. You know. We, yeah. As far as fullback positions, we're, we, well, we're starting, we are struggling at the moment. We're starting not, you know, Metzenaire's got injury problems and, you know, it's not really uh, the best of times at Minnesota United. It's so not. we are missing him. But who do you think will come out on top with this one? It's a tough one. It is a really tough one. In the Hassani of the week, I ended up going with my bias Yeah. And I feel like it's not right to do a double bias. Mm. So I'm going to go with LA Galaxy. Okay. And it it really pains me to say this, yeah. but I have to. It, I I think they are a stronger team with or without our fullbacks. Yes. I think and we don't have our fullbacks, which no, just backs don't. me we, up even more. We, <laughs> we do not. Uh LA Galaxy are clearly the better team this season. I think Chicharito is going to score one or two. It might be possible. Uh, and I'm going to have to go with you on this one with a Galaxy win. Um it's just not you know, we're not in the best of form these days. No, I, um, I would 100% As a season, agree. I think. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not ideal. In general. Uh, but so that's two Galaxy wins. So now we have to, one. we can go two of the same and then we have to yeah, switch. Yeah, okay. Um, And then the second matchup is, uh, do you want to go for this one first? No, you got it. I got it. Okay, it is Boca Juniors who, you know, you'll see later on in episode two. That's brought up again, but uh, uh, Boca Juniors versus Corinthians, and I mean, I don't know. It's it's a tough one. I think, obviously, wasn't uh Corinthians in like the Club World Cup, something like it that. It wouldn't have surprised me. I, I think they were. Um, it, if anyone is watching and gets mad because I'm not aware of the whereabouts of Corinthians, I apologize. I'm not. Yeah, it's an, not a huge. I, I'm list. not. A, I, I'm an avid follower, but I'm not an expert. Expert. Follower <laughs> expert. Of the Argentinian yeah. first division. Yes. yes. Is Corinthians is Argentinian first division. Yeah. Well, I would think maybe so. Brazilian. I honestly. I don't know why they're playing. When they're playing. <laughs> so, this is a matchup that's happening. I think they're we Brazilians. Know, we, I think they're Brazilian as yeah. well. So I don't know why. They're, <laughs> I don't know. I, I was gonna say yeah. yeah. But uh, we know we know Boca Juniors is a fantastic club. Yes. The the. Thing you were talking about for episode two, yeah. you'll hear next episode. We we had. I'm not gonna spoil. No, yeah, any, I'm not gonna spoil we anything. Won't, we won't, we won't. But it, it was fantastic. We talked about it for a little bit. But Boca Juniors has some fantastic derbies, some fantastic attendance, and overall historical uh, records that are really good. Whether that's in regards of producing talent yeah. or winning trophies and titles on a world stage, on a continental stage, or on a domestic stage. So. They're a very good club. Uh, you, I said you can go first on this yes. one. Yes. Well, I'm going to just follow that up with a Boca Juniors win, personally. Um, that's just I'm really solid. glad I get to go first on the last one because I'm oh, also going yeah, to yeah, have yeah. the same one as you here. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm saying Boca Juniors here, and yep. I, I know exactly who I want on the last one. All right. So, we, let's just get into it. Then. Yeah. For, the, for this second one, Boca Juniors is going to win. Yep. And hopefully, well, right now we're on track to only be off by one for our first. Yeah, and that's huge. That, that's huge <laughs> for me. Huge that's really huge. big for me. Yeah. Uh, the final game that we are predicting is Charleston Battery versus Atlanta United 2. Another team that is, it's the reserve team of an MLS team that is playing in the USL Championship. Some of the only, uh, actually, I think it might be the only two teams. It must be. That play in the USL Championship right now that are reserve teams to MLS teams. Yeah. Because everyone else has moved to MLS Next Pro. But in this one, I love Matt Sheldon. I love the Charleston Battery. I've seen their stadium in person. Uh, I've never been to a game, but I've seen their stadium in person. And I have watched, I think this season, like three or four of their games mm. fully. So I really like their team. I like the atmosphere that they bring. They have a, if you're ever in Charleston, you should go to a game. They have a really good setup. They have like 
sort of like Minnesota United have a, have a brew hall at one end. Oh yeah. That is, it's much less modern. It's more just like tents with, yeah. with like kind of like the stuff. old, kind of uh, like old, the old NASL days yeah. with Minnesota United. Yep. But it's a really cool community setup, and I, I really rate them as a club. So I'm going with the Charleston Battery here. They actually haven't had the best start of the season. No. If you guys follow the USL Championship, you'll know they haven't played as well as they would have wanted, making the signings that they did in the off season. But I still rate them and I back them. Well, I'm gonna go with a draw. Oh, yeah. so cheeky. I know. So you're always the draw I'm, merchant. I'm though. a draw man, and I realized I hadn't gone for a draw yet. And it's only right first episode of the new season to uh, continue on, and it's going to be a draw between these two huge teams you know huge matchup i think atlanta united too is maybe going to bring down a couple of their first team players you know to help them out and i think it's, it's gonna, possible it's they gonna do that a lot. Draw. yeah i think it's gonna end in a draw so. well there it is predictions done hasani done there's one more thing that we have in this episode one more that i think people really want to see so let's get to that right now all right well so- this is the class on grass weekly podcast indeed the first episode of season four i am one of your hosts leo larson and i'm here with mac brown yes we are back for season four we're super excited to be bringing you guys more content and an opportunity for you guys to get an inside look at different people involved in the soccer market whether that's players coaches trainers anything like that we're going to be bringing him on and what better way than to start out with mr cody roberto how are you doing Good. Yeah, everything's going well. How, how about yourself? I'm doing really good. Very the good. weather the weather is good out here in Minnesota. Very nice. For the three months out of the year that we get good weather. So <laughs> I'm, I'm in high spirits right now uh, as but, I get to go outside and, and play the beautiful game. And, yeah, and, you but know. you know, it, it could have been World Cup season right now. That's true. It would have been even nicer, right? We are missing out on that a little bit right now, yeah. but we do have Qatar in November to look forward to. We do. I'm watching a lot of 2018 World Cup matches right now myself, just on YouTube. So yeah. um, maybe it, it would be better if they were live, but obviously it's, of it's course, good. It's of good course. regardless. Well, for sure. the man of the moment right now, Cody Roberto, we want to talk about you. So let's just start at the very beginning of your soccer career. You're a boy in Canada. I, I'm assuming you, you came yeah. from Canada and now you're, you're back in Canada with your rideshare company, but you're a boy in Canada. Soccer is probably not the main thing that you're driven to by the public. So what got you into it? What got you started playing on a club or some teams and what really fueled that passion for you? Yeah, definitely. So I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario. So we're about, I think a six hour drive north of Minneapolis. Oh, really? I think growing up, we used to always go to Minneapolis for tournaments. And um, yeah, there's a lot of Italians in my city. So growing <laughs> up, like there was an Italian community. Obviously, they loved soccer. But we actually, uh, I don't know if this fact is still true. We had the most NHL players per capita in the world. So it was like a huge hockey town. Everybody playing hockey. But um, yeah, when I was growing up, my, my father loved soccer. He played. My whole family played soccer. So I was kind of born into it. And from when I was a little kid... Uh, all I wanted to do was be a professional soccer player. And so, yeah, I would be training in my basement every single day before school, after school. Then I'd be going to the soccer plex. I'd be like coaching and refing, and um, in between games going out and, and like, you know how there's halftime and then when teams are doing their warm up, I'd be there with a the ball practicing and training. So it was just, uh, I fell in love with the game early on and it was, uh, yeah, I just really like wanted that to be my life playing soccer and doing it as a career uh, in Europe ever since I was a little kid. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's wonderful. Was your dad, you said he played soccer. Did First off, did your parents come from Italy or did they uh, grow up in Canada? Grew up in Canada. So my grandparents okay. on my dad's side are from Italy. Uh, and then on my mom's side, they're from England. Um, but both my parents were born in Canada. Um, my dad was, he was a good player in our city and in, in the province, but I uh, never played professionally or anything like that. Um, but even when we were growing up, he would be, you know, training before uh, he'd go to work and coming home and training. So we kind of saw uh, a lot of work ethic from from his end growing up. Um, and yeah, he would he would work with us. And uh, and then for, for me, yeah, like the people I hung out with like really early on, um, or it was like my friends from soccer and then we sort of stuck together all through high school and uh yeah it was um when we were growing up it was literally all we did outside of school so yeah that's yeah. awesome um 
Yeah. So you had obviously that motivation and that love for the game from very early on where you just you were playing every moment you could. But yeah. when did you kind of realize that soccer could be something more and you could actually go somewhere with it to make a professional career out of it? Yeah, so it was tough. Like I had a strange path. So when I was growing up and I was like a really little kid, so let's say like, you know, from eight to 13, 14, I, I would train like three times a day. So I was uh, playing like a, I was felt like I was at a good level and in my head, yeah. like, no matter what, I was going to be a professional soccer player. Um, as I started to get into high school, I grew late. So I was like the smallest person on the team. Uh, I was riding the bench for my high school team uh, when I was 14 years old. So at that point, it was like really I had a ton of doubts. Um, I'll, like I was the slowest person on my team in high school. I was under five feet. I was under, uh, I think I was 95 pounds and just like, um, it was hard to kind of keep that dream going. Even the yeah. thought of getting a scholarship was sort of drifting away. So I went through this period where, yeah, it seemed, uh, almost impossible to get it done. And I just kept working, kept training, kept doing everything I possibly could. And then I had a friend that actually really helped. So we'd be watching EPL games and he would look and he'd be like, these people, they're not even that good. Like we could go play them. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, yeah. They were, if you're playing in the EPL, you're a great player. Yeah. Um, but he would just talk about it like it wasn't a big deal and it was super possible. And that just hanging around him gave me a lot of belief that like, you know what? Yeah, he's right. They're, they're not that good. You could actually like, we keep working, we could get there. And then eventually like I, I grew um kept working, kept training, improved. Uh, by the time I finished high school, I was like a different player than obviously starting high school and um, the first two years of it. So I started like starting in, in Thunder Bay, right? Thunder Bay is 110,000 people. It's a small town. Yeah. So even if you're, if you're like the best player in the city, which I wasn't, um, the odds are still kind of stacked against you, but it, um, we just kept working, kept, uh, kept pushing forward. And then, yeah, basically hanging out with that person gave me a lot of belief that like, I can go for this. I can do it. Um, and then from there, it was a crazy, crazy ride. That's it's awesome. so awesome when you have mentors or people around you that can help push you through those, those tough moments, especially in high school. And I've noticed this kind of, it, it, it's, it's surging now, but I think that's just because of the the amount of people that are talking about it versus maybe 10 years ago. But I definitely think the mental health or the the aspect of the game where you're talking about confidence or whether you're, you're still loving the game, it really hits players when they're in around high school. Yeah. And I think it's super, super important for people to be addressing now. But even you kind of talked about how you started facing those doubts. And I think it's important for players regardless of their age, but especially in high school, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, to really be understanding that those those doubts are going to come and it's important to get a good group of people around you to support you and continue pushing you along the way because you can't do it on your own 100 percent, it makes a huge difference it's like whatever you're trying to do if you're trying to do something really hard um yeah the first thing is it's like simple like you need to believe that it can be done right and yeah. uh yeah surrounding yourself with great people helps that's made a huge difference for me throughout my career as well um and then obviously putting in the work and being yep. able to analyze yourself and see all the areas of your game where, yeah, like you can spot areas that are weak and that need to be improved. The cool thing with, with your career too, even when, even when you're a lot younger, uh, if you start analyzing your game early on and seeing all of your weaknesses, all of your strengths, totally. and just like, I used to write three to six month, six month training programs, just targeting certain things. So there'd be like a three month chunk where I'm like, okay, I need to improve this area of my game. Every training session, I'm working on this every day before school. I'm working on this. And yeah, after three months, I'd see where I'm at. If it still needed a lot of improvement on that area, I would keep tackling it. Um, if there was another area that of my game that really had to improve, I'd go and kind of shift it and attack this other area. So yeah, it, uh, one of the coolest things is the progress you can make if you're if you just keep chipping away at it every single day and trying to get better yeah yeah totally and i mean we can already see your dedication was just immense in your career obviously from early on you you just seem like at such a young age you already understood how much it would take um even though you love the game it just how much it would take to get to that next level even though you were 
um so young you were still looking at analyzing you know your own games which pro players do you know even right now they do that every time film ses sessions and all that um so do you think your dedication and how it was every day every moment did that get you then to a club like Macclesfield Town um, where you were going across, you know, an ocean to then play in an unfamiliar environment? How did that kind of dedication help you make that move and maybe adjust into a different a different club and a different country? Yeah, definitely. So Macclesfield, that was like later on, I guess even mm -hmm. before that dedication was like the one thing that I had, like if you ask any coach or anyone that I played with, the one thing that I had from early days is just like every single team I was on, I was always the hardest working player. Yeah. Every team, I've never been on a team where someone would outwork me. And like when I went from Thunder Bay, basically my, my story is I finished high school. I was talking to different agents overseas at that time, made a lot of progress and improved a lot. Um, still really low level compared to players in Europe. I was like playing in Thunder Bay at the time. Um, but yeah, nothing really panned out. I went to Calgary, uh, another Canadian city for a mm -hmm. year. I was playing with a higher level team there. They were like the national champions, um, but still like a really, really low level compared to, compared to Europe. And um, at that point, nothing was happening overseas. So I just took all the money I had, uh, took out student loans and like, I'm not telling anyone to do this. Um, <laughs> and I booked a one-way ticket to Europe and I ended wow. up in an academy where, um, it was all foreign players. You had to pay your own way. And there was 26 of us. Where was this located? This was in Italy. Okay. Italy. Okay. And, yeah. and do you have like a passport to get to Italy? Cause I know a lot of people have issues when they're coming out of the United States thinking like getting work visas and getting opportunities to live in other countries, it, it comes at a price because you need to beat out everyone else who has eligibility to live there with a passport. So did you have that passport going there? I got it. Um, I got turned like, so I got turned down for a passport for wow. my English one and my Italian one. Really? And then uh, we found there was like this one random loophole that uh, after talking to a bunch of people, like I was able to get my Italian one, which made a huge it was a huge help okay. um and then yeah just a, another point for people watching this i don't know if this is still the case but there's countries that are a lot more friendly to canadians going over yeah. and playing so i think germany at the time was a lot easier if you didn't have a passport um i'm not sure what other countries now i think it was like germany holland were a lot easier than going to england or going to yeah other um, but there's also stories of like do you know jay demerit uh, i don't think i do who is he crazy story uh he played for the u.s national team played in the world cup but he had a similar path like booked a ticket to to england um he got a visa it was like he went to university i believe and he went to the uk and got a visa because he had the potential to get a job in something and he used yeah. that okay and started training with teams and like like i think he started in like either ninth or 11th division and then ended up being the captain of a um I think it was Watford, captain of Watford. Wow. Championship, really? Scored the winning goal to send them into the Premier League. Got the call up to the U.S. national team, played in the World Cup. There's actually a movie on him. Um, really? That's crazy. What's the movie called, just for anyone listening? Um, what is it called? I think it's called Rise and Shine. Okay. Rise and Shine. Okay. Jade Perfect. Merritt. I'll uh, make sure to watch that. That sounds like a crazy cool story. Oh, man. It Especially was because finding those loopholes like you said you had to get a loophole and him as well you know you can obviously get visas or permits to go somewhere if you say you're studying or going for education and then he used that as an opportunity to find clubs train with clubs network yeah. and and just i mean it's just you know scrapping to get any way or any bit into the next level and you see that from certain players like yourself and and him and it's just it's just a cool path so now yeah. you said you were in Italy playing at an well, academy. With Italy, like... Italy. And uh, by the way, like my first night when I landed in Italy, I booked my ticket, caught a flight there. And um, my first night when I was going towards our hotel, or not a hotel, it was, um, it was a house with like a bunch of other players. And um, when I was walking there, I, there was this concrete soccer field. And like, instead of basketball courts, they had soccer fields everywhere, like little yeah. concrete ones. And there were all these people playing. So I went and uh, played there. We started at I think maybe six or seven p.m. We played until two in the morning under the lights, and it was like one of the most incredible things. I'll never forget it. I'm like, this is where I'm supposed to be, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a city where it's like hockey is massive, and 
you know, just like soccer's not, um, obviously not the main sport. It was incredible to, uh, go there and just, yeah, play street soccer for hours and hours. Um, and then from there, I started training with this team. And to be honest, when I got there, I was, I was the worst player on the team, there were 26, <laughs> plus. Um, 26 players. And you knew that at the end of it, so we would basically train throughout the week and we would play against Italian teams after that, like maybe one or two, well, once a week you'd have a scrimmage. Um, and yeah, we, I knew that there'd be maybe one of us would get a contract, maybe two people max. Um, so yeah, from the start of the year, I wrote a program. I said, these are all the areas that I need to work on. I still wasn't fast. I still wasn't strong. Um, my holdup play was like really poor. There were all these things that just, I, I knew nothing about tactics. When I got to Italy, that was a <laughs> huge, like Italy, it's, you know, and when you're in practice, you spend almost half of every practice just working on tactics, sometimes without a ball going in yeah. doing different positioning. So tactics were a huge thing. And I was just so far behind. Um, but yeah, I wrote a program early on. I was training three times a day, every morning, getting up at five 30 to train, um, then come home, rest by 1130, going and doing another session on, like on my own, coming back and resting, then going to team training. We train, uh, every day it was around three o'clock. And then after that, um, I would either go to the gym and, was trying to get stronger and faster uh or there'd be another team that would train after our team was training so sometimes i would train, train with them i was probably like way over training but i just worked my butt off all year and uh gradually like we i didn't see much improvement you know the first month the second month but by the third month really the difference was like it was i, I was starting to notice it and uh by the end of the year it was a nine month thing by the end of the year, I was a completely different player. I went from being the worst player on the team to like standing out. And, um, and then we had this one game and it was, uh, it was against a team called Arezzo. So like a pre professional team in Italy. Um, and yeah, I basically said like, this is it. I need to, <laughs> this is like, there's going to be agents coming to watch this game. This is kind of what all the work I've been doing for. And in my head, I said, this is like the work I've been doing my whole life is like for this one game. And then I just got prepared for it and actually like had a great game. Uh, I think I scored two goals that game stood out. Um, and at the end, end of the game, nothing happened. So I was at, when they blew the whistle, I was like, this is it. Like I'm going to get a contract. <laughs> Everything is great. Um, end of the game, people were going up and talking to other players. No one talked to me. It was like, I was shocked, um, super disappointed. And then later that night, my coach called me and he said an agent reached out to him and, um, and that he wanted to talk to me. And um, anyways, there's another like kind of crazy story in that one, but basically I, I got taken to a team on trial and, um, and like got a contract. I um, was like, I've never been that excited in my life. Um, it was incredible. I was so happy. Um, again, like a crazy story. It's a bit of a longer story. So I don't know if it's worth going into. There was some like Feel free kind of to go bad, into it if you want to. <laughs> kind, of, kind of bad things that happen there. Like agents, be careful about like who you, who you deal with. This agent turned out to be um, like not a great person, mafia mm. type person. Wow. Um, really? Yeah. So there were some like crazy <laughs> things. and like That sounds dangerous. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically took me to this team. I got offered a contract and then, uh, yeah, no, this is, <laughs> then he wanted like pretty much all the money from the contract and almost no. like more and i uh, was making wow. like a lot of threats and things like this and i basically um yeah i was staying in this at this one place so like i left in the middle of the night to another place to go stay to like get away from this person and then i was training with the team and i told the coach everything that was going on and i just made sure that when i was in at practice i was the hardest working person i stood yeah. out and like um and then regardless of what was going on with the agent like the team would want me and yeah would if you, if you train hard they're going to want to protect you <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And so that's, um, that's what happened. Uh, I like just worked extremely hard, stood out in, in training. Um, the coach actually played for Inter Milan, which wow. is my favorite team growing up. And it was like, my, oh, my dream no was way. to play for Inter Milan. So like, yeah, Renzo Tasso. And it was a, like, just incredible. Uh, so I'm hanging out with this person who played for Inter Milan. Um, every day is teaching me new things. Like the growth I was feeling was incredible. Um, 
yeah, it was just like, and then when it came time to get an apartment, I got an apartment, literally, um, it's like a pretty big city. I got an apartment across the street from the field where from my bedroom, I could look and in the morning when I wake up, our stadium and our field was right there. And wow. uh, nice. yeah, it was just like, that's got to be really refreshing considering all the stuff that you went through leading up to that. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was incredible. It was like a dream come true for me. And I just, yeah. When I got there, it was just about working. So every single day in training, doing everything you can. Same deal. Uh, I was training, you know, like two to three times a day at this point, um, every single day. Like coaches would actually have to tell me to train less because uh, they were worried about me getting injured. I did actually get injured. Um, and it turned out to be this like kind of crazy injury at the time where uh, in Italy, they were calling it uh, Pupalgia. And they basically said, I met with different doctors there and they told me that um, basically there was no cure. There's like, uh, there's no cure. It's something that I have the rest of my life. And um, there'd be some months where I'd be able to play, some months where I wouldn't. And you just, there's nothing you could do. So I tried to play through it. Uh, I pushed through for like four months, got to the point where um, I started getting the pain in the other hip too. And I would just like, I, after training, I wouldn't be able to walk for two days. Right. So I'd like train for a day and then I'd be off for like two or three days, just in pain walking. So it was pretty, pretty bad. Um, and then from there, I'm like, I need to get fixed. So I talked to, uh, talked to my coach, got permission from the club. And like, obviously you're not making great money at this point too. I think I was, uh, I don't know if I was 19, 19 or 20, um, maybe, maybe younger. And yeah, at this point, I like asked the team for permission to leave and like go find a way to fix this thing. So I obviously did a ton of research online. I heard about this thing called prolotherapy in Canada with a doctor. So I met, went and met with this person and, um, he, you know, did his test, checked everything out. And he asked me the, the first thing he asked me was, um, what would you do if you could never play soccer again? And, uh, I'm like, well, that's, a, that's kind of a dumb question. What do you mean? He's like, uh, yeah, to be honest, like, I don't want to give you false hope. Um, you won't be able to play. Uh, you have this thing, there's no cure for it. And uh, you're just going to be this way the rest of your life. Maybe you can get to the point where you can go for jogs, like maybe light jogs two to three times a week. Um, but you will not be playing at a professional level. I don't want to give you false hope. And so uh, in the doctor's Jeez. office, I just said like, I don't really care what you say. Um, I'm going to find a way back. And yeah, maybe not the best response. Um, but yeah, I went home and that was like one of the what felt like probably the worst day of my life up until that point um is like my whole life I'd worked towards this thing in soccer and uh it just like kind of crushes your dreams there so I sulked for for a day and then it was just about figuring out what the next step is so getting other opinions me, meeting with other doctors and so I met with 19 different doctors and surgeons and um at the time I was playing you say 19 19 yeah that's crazy wow. yeah yeah um who all said I would never play again and, um, and then basically like, I was like playing poker to fund flights to go visit these people <laughs> and, um, just trying to scrape by whatever I possibly could to like, just see the next doctor, try the next thing. And, um, yeah, eventually I, I, there was this one, someone told me about a, a surgeon where it was a surgeon in the U S who invented this surgery. And, um, they said, you should go see this person. So, uh, again, went to go see them and. There was a lot of other things you had to figure out too. Like getting in to see these doctors was tough. Some of them had like year wait, that wait time. So you'd have to figure out how to get in in like a week instead sure, of a year. Yeah. Um, but yeah, went to see the surgeon and he thought he could fix me. Um, and it was like a crazy, crazy amount of money per hip. And I, I had no money at this point. So I was like calling banks, trying to get loans, trying to figure <sighs> out everything I could to scrape some cash together. Um, I had like played, uh, had a little bit of poker money. Um, so you were was, literally playing poker to get money. Yeah. I wasn't making a lot of money either. Just like oh, wow. to get the bare minimum. Just, just to get by. by to like, what game were you playing? Uh, Texas Hold'em. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That is crazy. So you must be pretty good then. Yeah. If it's, you know, your career's on the line. <laughs> you gotta make you successfully <laughs> went in the positive playing poker to fund surgeries. Not to, so to fund traveling to see doctors to see, to get surgery, not yeah. to pay for surgery. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then getting, getting the surgery done was insane. Um, eventually, like, basically I was able to, I had talked to my family and talked to everyone I possibly could. Um, 
some of the poker money like went into this like penny stock and there was a little bit of money there, but I ended up with like $30,000 when I needed 140,000 and then ended up getting uh, after like a long time, getting it on like a payment plan. And then I went and got two surgeries there. Both surgeries failed. Um, no, I got both hips done. Those didn't work out. Uh, and then from there I was basically doing rehab. There's this place in Dallas where um, they would let me. So I would, I would, basically uh i'd work for half the day and then they would let me do rehab for free um so i wouldn't get paid anything but i just worked to cover rehab which was like for me it was incredible um yeah did that for a long time wasn't able to get better then there was a, a doctor in philadelphia who was doing all these things like outside the hip joint um so i had like bilateral sports hernias i had a bunch of stuff going on with um, like my hip flexors, groin, all that stuff. Uh, and I met with this, this doctor and he was actually both, both surgeons were soccer players. So the first one had like played for the Canadian national team growing up. Uh, and then the second one, um, played, played at Harvard. And then basically I met with him and I'm like, you know, <laughs> showed him everything. He, he examined me and he said, I don't, I don't know if this surgery is going to work. Like I have no clue, uh, but if you don't get the surgery, I know you're not going to play again. Um, so yeah, like you can go forward with it if you want, but I have no clue if this is going to help you. Uh, and then obviously it was a no brainer. I'm like, yeah, of course I want to want to move forward with it, but then I had no money. So I was in Philadelphia and the surgery got canceled three times because I had no money to pay for it. Um, and I ran out of money there. Um, there was like, uh, yeah, about a day and a half, not, not that extreme, but a day and a half where like, I didn't have any money for food. Um, and then it was like the final time they were going to cancel the surgery and the doctor was leaving town for two weeks. Um, and they finally just put part of it on a payment plan, for, like to put most of it on a payment plan for me. Um, so instead of that surgery was like, you know, I think it was like 15 or $20,000. And instead I had to come up with like, I think it was 3000 or 5,000. And at that point, um, family chipped in, they helped out with that amount. Uh, I was able to get those surgeries and then go home and, uh, Actually, they almost canceled that one too, because I didn't have anyone in Philadelphia with me. So I had to like get someone to like come to the hospital and, you know, someone that knows you, otherwise they won't perform surgery. So yeah. I called a friend who lived like two hours away. He drove up, he like skipped work that day to like show up at my surgery and uh, sign off so I could actually get it, which is great. Um, I got those surgeries. Those didn't work out. Um, so now I'm like four fail. Well, that time they did both hips at the same time. So I had two operations on each hip, um, still had the same pain, still like, <laughs> you know, how many just, years out was this since you first started noticing this in Italy? Um, this is probably, this is probably two years now. Crazy. Wow. So you were, you were bouncing around for two years plus yep. until you were able to find anything yep. that could help you. For sure. Um, and then I had this incredible physio, uh, his name's Mark Ryan, a guy in Colorado who we would just talk and like, he was kind of following me on my journey here. And we just started trying different things and trying, like there were certain things that would make, give me relief for, you know, five or 10 minutes. And so we just did more of that. And we did this thing where like for four months, I, I didn't jog, I didn't do any weights. It was just like doing these random things that would give me a little bit of relief doing like light hip flexor stretching, a ton of glute, like just glute work. Um, and eventually after four months of that, I, I got to the point where I could walk pain-free and which is incredible. And then was able to get, you know, build up to jogging uh, for 30 seconds and then a minute and then five minutes and then 10 minutes. And then like built up to like jogging 30 minutes straight and then accelerating and changing directions and, <laughs> and then built back up to the point where I could get back to Italy. And then, uh, yeah, I got healthy, got back to Europe, um, and it was just one of the most incredible things, uh, like landing in Rome, I actually like started crying on the plane. Cause I just didn't know if I'd ever get back there. Um, so that was, that was really cool. And then in Italy, um, in Italy, when I first got back, I ended up, um, I was training with this team Brescia. They were like a, actually a really big club yeah, so yeah, for, I know, I know for a that short club. period. Um, and from there started bouncing around with different teams. Um, and just like Italy was incredible. Um, just like I met so many great people there. I played on so many different teams at like all different levels, but like lower than um, 
lower than obviously where I was my, my last club. Um, but yeah, it was, I, I just learned a lot. I had incredible coaches. Um, yeah. People that I still talk to today. Uh, a lot of my teammates, like just the one like pretty incredible thing in soccer, I guess things that I love about it are just the journey, right? There, yeah, you're going to yeah. run into so many obstacles along the way. It's insane. And like, keep the, being able to just keep driving forward. It, I think it builds a lot of character. Um, and then all the different experiences you have, like you can live in different places. You meet all different kinds of people, right? If you're, you know, go to countries where you have to learn a new language. Um, yeah. Even like, there's a lot of things that'll help you in the rest of your life too. So I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. I mean, like, I'm talking here. Wow. Yeah, you're, all <laughs> no, good. you're good. You're we, good. We love the stories that you share. Yeah, this it's, it's fantastic. Incredible. I mean, I just am thinking, you know, those that space of two or three years, obviously with Italy, and then going back and the journey to find a successful surgery. Um, obviously with anyone's soccer career, you could ask anyone. There's the rock bottom lows, and then there's the huge highs, and that's yeah. what you, you know we've talked about with like the mental health and everything like that you know, you have to balance that out and, you know, stay steady through even the lows and the biggest highs. And I feel like you have one of the most extreme stories that I could know of those like two years where you're just, you know, you're struggling, you you want that that dream so bad to keep playing and you finally got it. How, like what would be, I'd say the biggest lesson that you learned from that time, um, you know, life lesson where, you know, things aren't going well for you, but then you kept get, getting to it and you got back to a place where you can then thrive uh, past that. Yeah. So there's always a way. Um, yeah. I would just tell myself that every single day, there's always a way. And no matter what, like I made a decision early on that like every day I was going to do everything I could to get better and to, you know, go after this goal that I set. And yeah. so on days where you're just like, you know, four failed surgeries, you're still in pain walking. You're still like, you know, trying everything you possibly can, but you're just like mentally exhausted in a horrible place. It's like you're, you had a taste of this like dream, right? Yeah. Playing soccer in Europe that you want and it gets taken away. So days like that, um, I think making a decision ahead of time uh, to just, no matter how you feel like, again, this might be bad advice. It just really helped me. Um, no matter how I felt every single day, I did everything I could to improve. And uh, yeah. mm -hmm. just kept doing that every single day and telling myself there's always a way. There's always a way, even when it seems like it's impossible. And for the majority of that period, it did seem like it was impossible for me to get back um, in, in my head. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, just <laughs> there's always a way. Yeah, honestly, it's crazy. You're reminding me of this TikTok ad that I keep getting <laughs> for this app that The Rock sponsors where he's saying he had $7 in his pocket at one point, And now he's this like really successful obviously actor fighter or, or what would he do wrestling um yeah. and other stuff but it's reminding me of that story where it's just like there is always a way you can be in the absolute most rock bottom part of your life and then 10 years later you can see yourself living super successfully going on vacation seeing people that you love doing everything that you might have dreamed of and doing it while funding it with things that you also love. You know, that's a super important part of living life, you know, getting your means in a way that you love so that everything that you do is, is you know, helping your overall happiness and, and helping you live a, a successful and rich yeah. in, in experiences life. So I think that's so cool that you just keep going after that because I think a lot of people, especially in today's society, you know, they flake on things. They try one thing. It doesn't work for maybe two months. And then they switch up because they want to find that one successful, booming business. But, you know, it's so evident with everything you're saying. I mean, even if you go back to when you were 12, 13 years old, making four month long training plans just to improve on Incredible, one aspect yeah. of your game. It's, yeah. it's super motivational to see that you just got to keep your head down and keep working at whatever you're passionate about to try and make it to that next level or succeed. Um, one thing that I wanted to touch on, which you you spoke about a little bit um, when you were talking about that game that got you recruited initially from Italy, and I just wanted to go back to that because you said it felt like 
almost your whole life of soccer led up to that one game. Is that an outlook that you personally feel like helps you to perform or maybe hurts you? Because in that (laughs) moment, you said that you scored two goals. But I know from personal experience, sometimes if I put too much pressure on myself, it can make you crack. And everyone's different. But how do you respond to that sort of pressure? Yeah, so that's exactly it. Like everyone is different. And you sort of have to figure out what works for you. For me, I'm someone that if there's pressure, like I, I, I'll play at a completely different level. I actually need, like what I had to figure out throughout my career was um, on just regular games where you're playing against a mid table team or a lower, um, like lower table team. uh, How do you put that same pressure on yourself for me, which is totally different from, from other people. Um, So you'd be in the locker room and there'd be people that would be serious and would be focused and would be like, you know, just that's what they needed. There's other people that, would crack jokes and they needed it to be light before games. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, figuring out uh, it's something that I guess you could test it or just even look back for people that are watching this, look back at your past, you know, 20, 30, 50 games. Um, and then look at like the games where there are, where there is a lot of pressure and just try to find these patterns and, and then test things. Another thing that I did throughout my career was I tested things all the time to just see what would work, what wouldn't, Um, and I'd slowly like, you know, you might run a bunch of tests throughout the week in training and you notice like, I trained great today. What did I do differently? And you add that in there. Um, so for yourself, like if you, when you put a ton of pressure on, um, and like, I'm assuming you, you, you have a bad game when that happens. Yeah. I I feel like sometimes I put so much pressure on myself and then I don't perform the way I want to, because I'm thinking about all of the reasons that I'm putting pressure on myself. So like you said, everyone's different. You got to find your way that makes you feel like you perform best. For sure. And then even, um, I guess another question for you is when that's happening, like, do you feel like you're losing confidence as well? Um, I think over time, uh, I, I don't know about you, Mac, if you have a similar experience with, with pressure, but over time with myself, I think I've changed. Uh, yeah. I think I've gotten better at uh, manually instilling confidence in myself as I've gotten older, especially within this past year. So I don't think that's as big of an impact. Um, although it used to be a much bigger deal for me, I just yeah. feel like for some strange reason, when I put that much pressure on myself, I don't feel like I can perform as much or as well, because I think I'm thinking about too many things on the field instead of yeah. trying to get into the flow of the game. But obviously, like you said, it's, it's so different for everyone. I mean, you, yeah. you play, I play it. All three of us have played soccer throughout almost our entire lives. And yeah. all three of us probably have a, a super different story, just like everyone listening, whether you're a soccer player or a business owner or both like Cody, um, yeah. it, with whatever you do, you just got to find what, what works for you. And then you got to run with it. Well, yeah. re- resuming to your career, now you're back in Italy, you said, and you, you finally touched down in Rome. You, you got yeah. a little bit teary-eyed because you're, <laughs> you're finally back to playing the game. But where do you go from here? Yeah, so from there, I, I basically, um, how did I end up at Brescia? There's a whole side outside of the game that you know people should know about as well. So um, being able to connect with other players, other like, you know, agents, having contacts and sorry, it, it does make a difference um, when you're going overseas. So I worked a lot on that side of it as well. I met different players that were much further ahead than me. Um, they helped a lot. They gave a lot of advice. Um, yeah, and ended up uh, ended up at, at Brescia for a little bit. Um, and then from there, and, and before that, I basically contacted every player I know, every coach I knew, told them like, I'm healthy, I'm coming back. <laughs> and, uh, um, and sort of ended up, ended up there, which was great. Um, and then from there, I went to another team, again, just through networking, connecting with people. Um, I ended up getting a trial with this team, uh, Old Genetese, and it was like Lake Como, uh, which is like one of the most incredible places yeah, in the world, beautiful. like our training field. Uh, so the whole, like when you would look back, uh, it was actually kind of distracting, but you'd look like behind the net and there would be like all these mountains. It was incredible. Wow. I lived uh, like a block from, yeah, one of the most beautiful lakes in the world. It was insane. Um, so I was there. I had a lot of inj- injuries throughout my career too. So I ended up getting injured after three months. So that was, that was frustrating, but um, 
yeah. Uh, and then I, the coach, that coach, by the way, like he was the probably one of the best tactical coaches I ever had in like in my life. Um, so for him, that whole period, even when I was injured and just in the stands, like I would watch and study. And after training, I would go, um, learn more from him. I'd go for dinner with him and his family and just pick his brain uh, every single chance that I got. When I switched teams after, I would still call him and ask, like every team you go into, they'll, they'll have like often different formations. They want yeah. you to play a different style. So I'd ask him, get feedback. Um, yeah. And then from there, started bouncing around different clubs. Um, I ended up going to Sardinia, which is like I, one of the most incredible places I've ever been. It's just like Island off the coast of Rome. And um, yeah, I was there for the first time I was there for a year. Again, met some incredible, incredible people. Um, that's actually a place where like, I want to live for like, you know, a large portion of my life now. The people Later on. Are incredible. What's that? Later on. Yeah. 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 Cool. And then it was about, yeah, the first place where I felt like outside of Canada, where I actually felt kind of home, right. Where like I could live in this place. And just, yeah, you meet so many incredible, incredible people. Um, I know, yeah, we're talking about the soccer side of it. I guess one, one story <laughs> about confidence in Sardinia. So when I first got there, um, I was still younger. I can't remember how old I was at this point. I think the injuries and all that, it's a little bit blurred right now. I think that was around 19, 20, and then out for two years. So it's probably like, then I played with Brescia for a bit, Olginatese, and um I was probably maybe 23 or so, 23 or 24. Um, when I got there, like first game with this team, uh, no one in that re region or that league like knew who I was. Um, but I came off the bench, first game, hit the crossbar and got an assist and had like an incredible <laughs> game. Uh, second game, I think I scored like one or two goals. And then I went on a bit of a, a scoring run and was on, probably in the best form of my life to date up to that point. Right. And even, um, even at, like at that level, you'd have newspapers writing about you, like, like about the teams every week and all these things. So like, you'd have newspapers writing about you, you'd have your picture on the cover. You'd like go around in the town and like people would restaurants wouldn't let you pay for dinner and all these <laughs> things. And it was like, it was like your first kind of taste of, um, like what you think about if you're like a little kid, like, Oh, you're a professional soccer pro player. And, I don't even know if that league was pro at the time. It might've been semi-pro. Um, but yeah, it was like a pretty incredible feeling. And then I had another small injury and I kept playing injured. Um, so I like, what happened? There was two things that happened. I cracked a rib and I was playing through it. Um, and like, I started having bad games. So I went from like, the, you're scoring goals. You're like the person that the team's counting on and everybody in the city really likes you. Um, to when I, when I wasn't scoring, it turned. And then like every week in like the newspapers, they'd like write kind of like not so nice things. And you go out in the grocery store and people would be like, you're not scoring. What's wrong with you? Ugh. Um, and so on the confidence side, like I started getting like really, you, you know what you were talking about, how you feel, uh, if you put a lot of pressure on yourself before games, you would, um, sort of lose you would just like lose confidence. You wouldn't play as well. That started happening to me. And I started missing like easy scoring chances. And then there was this one guy um, who he played for Roma and it was, it, I, I went to a restaurant uh, after, after like a tough game, we, we lost. I had a pretty bad game. We we're getting like kind of ripped apart. And then he basically told me, he gave me this advice, which like helped me a ton throughout my whole career. So maybe it helps some people listen to this. Um, he said, I saw you play when you first got here and you stood out. And like, he's like, I know you're a great player. He's like, you know, you're a great player. He's like, you're injured right now. And he basically told me to get healthy. And then just all, no matter what, always know, like in your, in your head, when you step on the field, you have to believe that like, you're the best player on the field. You have to believe that like you're, um, yeah, that you like, you have to know what you can do and believe in it. Right. And he basically told me, it doesn't matter um, if fans tell you like how good you are or how bad you are or sort of what's going on. Like all that matters is, you know, that you're a great player. You keep working every single day. And when you step on the field, you have no, like, you don't have to worry about all that stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, like 
like I'm assuming you're a really hardworking player. You're going to improve a lot from where you are right now as well. So like before you step on the field, if you keep telling yourself, like there might be other things that you can learn. This just worked for me. Um, but I used to tell myself before I'd go on the field, I'd be like, I'm the best player in the world. Right. At the time I wasn't. <laughs> um, yeah. But I would tell myself that before I go on the, on the field for games and it would just give me this added confidence. Like confidence makes a huge difference when you're going to play to allow you to play at your best. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that like that one conversation with this one player um, I used all throughout my career and I never had that problem. Uh, I don't think I've ever had that problem again where I would, you know, you miss an easy chance and all of a sudden you're like nervous and you're worried yeah. and you hear fans booing um, like that all went away and it allowed me to like enjoy the game way more as well. Um, yeah. That's a random story from Sardinia. <laughs> no, that's good. I like, obviously how you've said it, the fans and even whatever location you're playing in that, you know, surrounded by that culture does affect your game in many ways, but um, kind of pivoting over to then, your UK experience, um, how did that differ? And, you know, obviously there's a lot of meaning in your part of your life in Italy, but then how did that differ when going to the UK um, uh, with England and in Wales as well? Did the, you know, the fans experience, is that different? Was, you know, you know, just the culture of England different? And, you know, how did that affect your game? Um, so England was... Oh. England was, I, I guess, sort of similar, a little bit different though. Um, but yeah, like in England, I had a great experience with fans. Like they were super supportive, even when things weren't going, like even if I had a bad game or things like that, I'd have people, you know, coming up after and talking to me and um, just like, yeah, in England, it, it helped a lot. People were super supportive for me. I'm sure that's not, maybe that's not the case everywhere, but um the other thing that really helps too that I noticed in England is like there's all these other people at the club. So you have the players, you have the coaches, but like people that are volunteering at the club, people that are cooking meals there, that are cleaning up the club, that are, you know, <laughs> driving the bus, all these things, just all so many people that are involved in a club and you sort of like all become this family. So um, yeah, like Kevin, Kevin Drew is my last club is the Welsh Premier League and like some incredible, incredible people. And I always felt like a ton of support. Um, again, when things were going good, everyone is like behind you and cheering for you. But even when things were going bad, um, yeah, you were all in it together. And it was like that with the fans too. It was a really, really cool experience. Um, and then even before games. So like all, a lot of, a lot, I don't know if it was season ticket holders or who, but like a lot of people would go into this one area they would hang out before games. They'd have some food. They might uh, like grab a beer or whatever. Um, but yeah, some of the players, like we go in there and talk to people and hang out and you, you get to know a lot of the fans and the people that are behind this club. And yeah, it was uh, it, like, that's the place where I felt more support than like any other club I played at uh, in my life. Right. It was a pretty cool, pretty cool experience. And like thinking about it, yeah, there's, there's people that I really miss that I got to get back to, to go see. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. So your time in the UK, you played just for, for the people listening to know, you played for Macclesfield and Kevin Druids. Is there any other team that we're missing in th uh, that description? Um, so there's teams that like, when I went to the UK, I was coming from Italy, didn't have like much of a CV for England. People didn't really know me. Um, so I went originally went to this one game just to kind of give you an idea of the UK you can move up really really quickly if you score goals and you play well yeah like probably quicker than most countries okay. so for me I went um I went in this there was like I, I had an agent at the time and he sent me in this like trial game it was before preseason started uh and then in that game uh, like I just made sure that I, I did well. So I scored four goals in the first half. Um, <laughs> and then from, Hefty from amount. there, <laughs> what's that? Hefty amount. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then from there, this Italian, uh, like Italian agent, like basically there was a couple English agents there too. And people that saw me play that uh, like, wow. Okay. Uh, so then they 
They didn't know if I could play in England. It's a lot different than Italy, right? Italy's like slower pace, extremely tactical. Yeah. Um, England is just like tons just of go. <laughs> zero tactics. Like I have no friends in England, um, but very little <laughs> tactics. Um, and so from there, they took me to like took me to like a tenth division team. It's like a really low level. And then from there, I scored a hat trick uh, in the first half. It, this is like. I don't know if this is preseason or what sort of hat trick again in the first half. So now it's like two games um, at seven goals. And then from there, uh, I basically wanted them to take me on trials with like good teams. Um, how did I end up with Macclesfield? There was another team, Stockport County, um, that they were a championship oh, yeah. club uh, that like was struggling and they went under, but they had huge following. Uh, yeah. I love that field, but yeah, I actually, <laughs> Got this list off a of player, uh, another player who basically went from went from fifth division to the Premier League in one season. Uh, wow! Yeah, like a good friend of mine just crushed it, moved up, signed with Swansea, and uh, that's incredible. Yeah, so he had this list of like different coaches. So I just started calling up random coaches from <laughs> clubs, and this guy at Stockport County actually answered, and uh, they had a, a reserve a reserve team, and uh, I just said, "Hey, I'm trying to get some games while, while I'm here." Um, I scored seven goals in the last two halves that I played. Uh, can I come out? And then said, yeah, sure. So then I went there I think I scored, um, I scored eight goals and eight goals and like four assists and three games with them. Um, and then from there, uh, I was training with Macclesfield. How did that happen? I'm trying There's a to lot think. of bouncing around. It's crazy. The English Tons league. You just I, like what I'm hearing from you, and what I've kind of heard from other people is that you can just bounce around like crazy with how well the system is sort of set up between first division to all the way, like you're saying, tenth division. It's yeah. so fluid, and yeah. loan spells are a thing. And when you're down in the tenth division, I mean, a contract probably doesn't mean too much. So like you're yeah. probably you can just move around pretty fluidly. I also would like to add, just for anyone listening, I don't think we said this in the beginning, but Cody, you are a striker, so. Yeah. You are scoring a lot of goals. It's your job, but he's not playing center back. He's not. He's not scoring, he's not scoring from left back. So, <laughs> so yeah. just just to note that for people, not to undermine at all the insane accomplishments that he has with his goal scoring tallies in certain countries, but just to let people know the position that he played in. That is yeah. so cool, though. All yeah. of the bouncing around and, and moving around. One thing I have to ask is, outside of the soccer in the UK. <laughs> What was your favorite part about the culture? Was it the food? Was it the people? The <laughs> what, like, what, what did you love about being in the UK, whether that was in England or whether that was in Wales in the Welsh Premier League? You know, what, what was it you loved? So for me, like I, pretty much everywhere I go, I love the people. So like England, I still have some of my, my best friends there. Um, I met up with actually two weeks ago, met up with some friends from England. We all went to Mexico. And uh, like now I'm, I'm my goddaughter's from England. Uh, so yeah, just the people are incredible, super welcoming, uh, the, at least, yeah, they were really welcoming with me. I was in Manchester, I was living there and, um, it, it's fun. Like I like being in cities too. I like going downtown and, uh, yeah, just looking around and seeing people in action. Um, so that was great. And then just like, they're obsessed about soccer. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it's a pretty incredible place to to, to go to and then like bouncing around to in England, other other countries, you have to sign these contracts, like pretty much at every level, you're signing for like either one season or multiple seasons. In England, if you're if you start in a lower level, um, you can sign non contracts. So you can get called up to another team at any point. So that whole story I told you that was like in a one month period. Uh, oh, and wow. then I think it was one month. Yeah. And then it ended up signing with Mac. Um, and yeah with, with mac right here with mac <laughs> with me <laughs> that's it uh, that's it yeah we signed with we signed with macclesville town and uh yeah. and then from there it was like a great start in the uk um and again people move like quick and if you just uh, and then for the center backs listening to this i think jared jaden merritt was a center back as well so you could you could google it google it and, and check it out um but yeah, from there, I ended up getting injured again, uh, had a couple more hip surgeries um, and they were like a lot worse this time. I had an incredible surgeon who helped me out and helped me get back. Um, and then, yeah, basically from there, got back to 
the UK at that point, like, well, what was that Mac? Uh, like, I mean, that's Macclesfield town. Um, yeah. <laughs> again, like I was on this, this spree, things were going really well. So there was other teams calling me at that point as two. Um, so one of the teams that was looking at me, um, at that stage that actually like went to train with them, uh, as well, like during this whole, during that whole previous period, uh, when I got healthy and got back, um, they gave me a call and, uh, wanted me to come out. So I went out, um, trained with them, did well. This was after recovering from like two major hip surgeries that were way worse than like the first round that I had. Uh, so that was a whole other story. And then started a company during that period too, while I was at home doing rehab. Um, but yeah, that was, that was Kevin Drew's. And then that's the last club I was with. And when I got there, I had this trial, um, again, like they were, they were, it was a decent, decent level. And like the coach told me before I signed, he's like, listen, um, just so you know, you're going to be a bench player. Like you're not going to start at all this year. And, um, as long as you're okay with that, right. Like you might be in the stands, you might be on the bench, but like, you're not going to get a lot of playing time. And then, uh, I said, great. Like, yeah, just, uh, I'll just keep working and when my chance comes, I'll, I'll take it. And as long as uh, sooner or later, I'll get some playing time at some point to show what I could do. Great. Um, so I signed. And then the first game of the season with, uh, with Kevin Drudes, uh, the other striker, the starting striker got hurt in the warm up, Right. Wow. And so I was on the bench and then yeah. the coach tells me like five minutes before the game, he's like, you're starting. I'm like, okay, yeah. great. Um, like obviously it sucks that the person got hurt and he's a good friend of mine. Um, but, but yeah, it was just that you have to be ready for these opportunities when they, when they come. Uh, my first game just like had an incredible debut. Uh, I think I scored two goals. I'll have to go back and double check. I think it was two goals on my debut and just like had one of the best games of my life and then got the starting spot and uh, started like most games after that. And had an incredible incredible experience uh with that club uh yeah how Just yeah all really good people that i'm friends with uh, to this day yeah how was um how was that like how do you do that mentally when you're i mean we see it watching i know we both just watching games and then you hear about that like a player gets injured and they're like oh but now this guy's starting or even like subbing on in extra time in like the 118th minute when they su su sub in players just to take penalties like how do you think just from your experience with this uh knowing you're starting only a, a couple minutes before you know the game kicks off how did how does that like what does that do to you mentally when are are you in a space before where you're like okay i'm gonna take it easy i'm gonna be a sub i might get on to okay, I need to like rev it up and really be prepared to start. How does that really affect you mentally? Yeah. So for me, I knew that and this happened on other teams too, where like, if I wasn't the starter, I knew my chance would come and I yeah. knew I had to be ready when it would. So anytime if I was on the bench um, or even if I, even if they told me I was in the stands, things can happen at the last minute, you could be on the bench and then you could end the up stands. <laughs> this, well, this time I wasn't, but you could. Yeah. That's yeah, yeah, crazy. Yeah. But th this game, I wasn't in the stands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But even but, um, in other games, hop over the railing, and go onto the field. <laughs> <laughs> no, so like let let's say it's um, it has to be a certain period before the game starts. Yeah. But if yeah. you're if they tell you in, you're in the stands for the week, for for that week weekend's game, like you still have to be ready because yeah, you get injured, something can happen. You might be on the bench and then actually go play. Um. So yeah, I was ready. Like that game, I went in. Uh, even before when he told me like. You know, you're not going to play this, or you're going to really play this season. You're going to start on the bench. In my head, uh, that first game, I said, I'm going to get on the field, and I'm 100% going to be ready when it happens. It happened sooner than I, I thought, but I was ready, and I was just excited to to go do it. This was what I was working for. This was what, like, I, I knew sooner or later throughout the season, I'd come off the bench and get a chance. It just happened to be from, like, the first minute of the of the season. Um, <laughs> so yeah, incredible. That's Awesome. That's so cool though. And like, sometimes you just have to have that little bit of luck and then you got to take your chance. You know, it's, it's a combination of things that are out of your hands and things that are in your hands. And then once you get an opportunity in your hands, you got to take it. 
And yeah. it's it's great to hear from from people who have played at the highest level that it doesn't change. You just got to keep working. You got to keep staying prepared and ready. And then once you get that chance, you got to take it. Before we pivot to the company that you've made, we want to talk about also what you've done off the pitch, which is super, super cool for anyone listening who is a soccer player, wants to be a soccer player, but also has other hobbies or interests. Um, before we pivot to that, you said or you talked about how all of the people within the clubs in the UK were super nice to you, and not only the people that were in that family of the club, but also the fans. You said you would go into the the pubs near the clubs or, or within the clubs before yeah. the games and talk to people. Yeah, was that part of the UK culture? Something that that you felt like was was a huge impact on you. Did you feel like that was one of the biggest reasons that you liked the UK? And also, do you feel like that was that was very different from playing anywhere else, um, or do you feel like that was just something unique at maybe the certain clubs that you were at, and that could have happened in other countries? Um, so I think like most places I've gone, there's been incredible people. Whether it's in the club, whether it's outside of the club, um, the UK was a little bit different. Where like there was. <laughs> a bit more of a connection with the, with the fans where you're actually like, like I said, going and hanging out in the pub with them, getting to know them, seeing like their kids hanging out. Like it was a pretty cool thing. Yeah. I think that that probably played a huge role in like the connection I feel with Kevin Drudes and with all the fans there. Like I really, um, really, really enjoyed my time there. And yeah, that, that, that likely played a massive role. Um, I think there's good people everywhere as well. So Italy, I had some incredible people. Uh, there's like, I can give you another story if you want it. Sure. One here. How about it? Yeah. yeah. Another story. So basically, what stage was this at? I was in, the, in between clubs. I was struggling to get a team and like running out of money. And um, I basically took the rest of the money I had and booked a ticket to go on trial with this team that called me. And when I showed up there, like most clubs will have a place for you to stay, like a hotel, you'll have all your meals and everything. After the training session with this team, which like went, went pretty well, they're like, okay, we'll see everybody. Uh, see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> they didn't have anything set up for me, which is like oh, strange. Um, wow. Yeah. And then, so for me, I just like, you had to like fend for yourself. Yeah. And then had no money. So I like went to the train station of this town and um, I'm like, okay, well, whatever. I like had my luggage and I'm just hanging out there and I'm planning on sleeping in front of the train station and just going to training the next day. And, wow. uh, there's a bar, a, a, there's like a cafe there. Right. And there's the, the owner of the cafe who we start talking and, uh, he heard my story and then he ended up like giving me food, gave me a place. There was this little room above the train station that like was empty. He let me stay in that room. And, um, I ended up getting a contract, signing with that team and staying and like living in that city and things were great. But like during that period where like ran out of money and I'm on trial with this club and like, you know, that person helped me out and they didn't have to. It was like yeah. an incredible thing. And I still, I talked to this person today. That was probably, uh, I don't know how many years, maybe like seven, eight years ago, maybe longer, um, probably longer actually. And yeah, it was uh, one of the most incredible things that <laughs> that's happened to me. And I try to pay it forward wherever I possibly can now. There's been so many different people along the way that have helped me and i um, incredibly grateful for it. So, yeah. It's, it's crazy what can happen if you just ask or if you just try to form a relationship with someone. You know, people, I think a lot of people have a perspective that you need to be really close to someone for them to help you out or for them to offer a hand, but there are really good people out there. And I think your story really highlights that and shows that all you have to do sometimes is ask, all you have to do sometimes is make a friend at a pub, and then you can have a, a touch point or a connection in that area. And that's just so beautiful. Now, I want to shift to the company that you've created because it's really cool. And I think it it's able to highlight that footballers are able to have other passions and they're able to have other things that they really go for. And it's super important because once you're done playing football, regardless of if you've made enough money to sustain yourself afterwards or not, it's really important for people to have hobbies and interests that they that they can go to because obviously you can't play football forever. Maybe for some people that's coaching, for some people that's running a podcast, or for some people that's doing what you did, but I think it's really cool. So if you can explain that to everyone, I, I think I could try to explain it, but I think you could do it best as you're the CEO of the company. So, yeah, maybe. so just maybe. Let, <laughs> let everyone know uh, what it is that you've created and you know why you started it. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, so basically when I was, I got injured uh, at Macclesfield Town, right? And from that point, I went back home. I had to get a couple of other operations and I was going to be out for at least a year. And so um, in my city, it was just like anytime I'd go out, if I went out with friends or with family, like at the end of the night, you see crowds of people stranded with no ride home in minus 30, right? So that's Celsius. I think it's a similar, uh, when you translate minus 30 Celsius to Fahrenheit, I think it's close. Okay. Um, Still very, very cold freezing in, freezing incredibly and cool. uh yeah. people would wait over an hour for taxis if it was a holiday you could wait three to four hours um so people would walk home you know it might take over an hour to get home but they would walk in these temperatures or they would drink and drive and i've had friends who have passed away from like getting hit by an impaired driver also have friends who have been behind the wheel and like killed someone so it's a pretty pretty serious thing and um i started giving people free rides but couldn't put a dent into these like crowds of people and i just thought like this is a problem that shouldn't exist there was no Uber in my town. Um, and I just thought like, okay, I have this time off from soccer. I'm getting these operations. I'm going to do my therapy, rehab, everything I have to do. Um, but I think I can fix this problem uh, for my city, for my hometown. So we got to work. We launched this rideshare company in my city. And um, I knew nothing about business. And it was chaos. And uh, it was like, yeah, pretty insane. And then it turned out to be a much bigger problem in like smaller communities around the world. There's like over a billion people living in smaller towns. A lot of them don't have access to reliable transportation. Um, so yeah, we're basically, um, that's the company. It's uh, an app you can download. It's called you ride and, um, you can click a button and get a ride. We had to learn a bunch of new things to operate in these areas where companies like Uber and, uh, other rideshare companies, traditionally like don't and have a have, have a really hard time doing it and another cool thing is like in in business the majority of things that we do i actually took from soccer so everything that i learned on all the different teams i played on um the different coaches i've had i just like take things from these experiences throw it into business and it's been working out um and i think another thing too is like yeah the, the lesson soccer teaches you as well just the drive overcoming obstacles, dealing with like a thousand different problems along the way, which most players that have played professional at some point, like you're going to deal with a crazy number of obstacles. So um, I think that drive and that like tenacity, tenacity can be applied in other things after your career. And maybe that's coaching. Maybe it's other things in the soccer world. Like you said, um, maybe there's other things that you're passionate about that um, you can <laughs> kind of use that to, to go into. Another thing I noticed too, that just, for people listening to this, um, when I got to Europe, one thing that I, I was a little bit surprised about was um, like a lot of players, you'll train, you'll do your stuff with the team. And then like players will like play video games for a lot of the day or, you know, go have dinners and just hang out, which nothing wrong with it. I guess you're recovering, but there's a lot of time that gets wasted. So yeah. if you're doing everything that you can, training on your own, doing whatever you need to like, you, you know, like identifying your weaknesses and constantly trying to improve them and improving your strengths. Um, even after you do all that stuff, you might have like an hour or two hours a day where some people watch movies, some people do things with that, like that. For me, I, I just didn't want to put any time to things like that. So I put it into solving this problem for my city. And now, um, now we're like launching a bunch of other cities too. Hopefully, that is hopefully so cool. This problem yeah. Around. Yeah, I mean, I we could already see that the dedication you had throughout your soccer career obviously would translate into your your business career and um even your planning ahead and your planning of these workout plans for the future and for months ahead. Uh I'm curious what you know your plan is for the future. I'm sure you have uh you know something set up and I'm just wondering what, you know, the next step is that you're you're looking forward to right now. Yeah. So right now um, we're launching more cities. So we're in 10 cities mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, there's 18,000 cities, uh, you know, that we're looking at. Right. Yeah. So there's, it's a massive problem around the world. Uh, so yeah, for us this year, our goal was to be the best in the world at launching these markets that we're going after. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're making a ton of progress on that. We're learning a bunch of things and like as a company and 
yeah, we'll just keep launching cities. And after we become great at launching these markets, there's going to be another problem, another area that we really, really need to improve throughout the company. And we'll shift the whole company's focus to that. So similar to like, it actually is really similar to, to sort of the path that we took, in, like I took with soccer, right? Mapping out all your weaknesses, mapping yeah. out what you need to improve, um, what your strengths are, and then just going and executing and getting it done. And then doing it again and again and again. Yep. Most definitely. So do you feel like your passion and drive is shifting to you ride? Or do you think there's still something left within the soccer industry for Cody in the future? Well, honestly, I'm super passionate about you ride right now and like building a team and all the people that are working with us and, and solving this problem. So it's kind of strange for me that it, it has shifted. Um, I won't say that there's not something like left in the tank for soccer. Uh, yeah. Right now, I got got to get healthy and recover from another another hip issue. But um, yeah, I, I'm really excited about life right now. I'm yeah, excited about that's business, awesome. Soccer. Yeah. I'm definitely going to go back and, and visit my old club as well as other ones and um, see all the people. And if yeah, as far as playing, we'll we'll see what comes in the next uh, couple months here. Well, whatever you choose, Class on Grass Media Weekly's podcast is in full support of that. Before <laughs> we finish up, we have, what is it, four quick fire questions and then two closing questions. Um, yeah. The two closing questions are just ones that we're asking every single person that we interview. Um, yeah. We just want some stability between everyone to see what they think and how they respond to these. But first, the quick fire ones. I'll go first. What's your yeah. go-to pregame meal? Pregame meal? Um, so I would have... Uh, Italy, it's different in Italy and England. Italy, they <laughs> have like a feast before game. Yeah, really? Course. It's yeah. insane. So you have like, I could walk you through it, but you have a little bit of salad or um, vegetables, some kind of vegetables to start. Then you have pasta. Usually you'll have it without sauce and just a little bit of olive oil, a small bowl. Then you'll have um, like really lean meat cold cuts. Um, from there, players will either have fruit or they'll have this like, crostata cake like almost like a cake type thing really kind of wild pre-game uh, pre-game it's just like pre-game when yeah, that, that's crazy when i got that, i'm thinking how the heck are people eating this and then go <laughs> but it's like most teams throughout all different leagues like have a similar thing that's um, incredible yeah and that'll be like you'll start eating three and a half to four hours before the game uh you want to be done like three hours before the game so yeah italy but like not as much food as Italians. That was a good pregame meal. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was it. A little bit of pasta, a little bit of meat, some vegetables and fruit, and then coffee. I'd always have um, two shots of espresso before games just to get me like, <laughs> just to get, get going. going. Yeah, exactly. I need the passion. Um, yeah. All right. So, our second quick fire question is What is your favorite cleats of all time that you've worn? Oh man! Um, I, I see you wear the or you have worn the true Tanachis. I saw that on. I looked yeah. at like the Kevin Droids Twitter, and they had a COVID post of you training, <laughs> and I was like, he's wearing the true Tanachis there. Those shoes, like I. So d another story about a soccer player, professional soccer player. Those are my favorite shoes of all time. Really, by, really, okay, by far, like wow. no comparison. And it was shocking to me. Um, it's shocking to me because yeah, Jim actually like he lives in Manchester. He's an American, played professional soccer, was really annoyed with how his foot would move inside his, his shoe. And so he invented this sock and uh, that guy like should get him on the podcast. <laughs> like his story in soccer and in business is insane. But he basically invented this sock, moved to the UK, started going and knocking on clubs doors just to like get them on players, ended up building it into like, it's like, you know, players around the world are wearing the, the socks now. Nike yeah, and Adidas yeah. went on a mission to kill his company. After they, first, they tried to buy his company. He rejected it. And then they went on a mission to try to kill his company. And like, now he's pivoted from the sock. They still have the sock to create yeah. this shoe. And like, that guy is one of the most driven, like, per perfectionists I've ever seen. And like, wow, he... For about two years, I'd go and train with him if I had days off or things like that. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he would always, every single training session, he'd see the little thing he wanted to change on the shoe. Kept changing it, changing it, changing it, constantly improving it. And then when I finally got my pair, 
Um, I went to training and it was just like, you felt so much control. They felt so light. It felt like the touch was, um, I don't know if you guys remember like Addy Pures at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, the touch felt like that, but they felt almost like, like vapors. Um, and then your foot just felt locked. So Perfect yeah, combination. I scored in my first game with them. Uh, and I love that shoe. Really? Nice. Wow. Yeah. All right. The next one would be if you were on Ox in the locker room before the game, what would you be playing? What album, playlist, genre would you be putting on for the whole team? Oh, man. Um, what do I listen to before games? So it changes. Um, usually someone else is on that one. I'm not great with like picking music, <laughs> but let's say like the Rocky soundtrack. Okay. I, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. yeah. That'll work. That'll nice. get everyone fired up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then finally, uh, what was your favorite stadium that you've played in? Favorite stadium. Um, so I got to say this one, like Stockport County, which like it's, it's, there's bigger stadiums and like more famous ones, but like that stadium for some, I, I think I, yeah, I had like eight goals in three games and I just felt like incredible there. I'm not <laughs> sure what it was. Um, that was my favorite stadium by far out of anywhere. That's awesome. That's really cool. I mean, it, yeah. it, it cuts it for us. I, I've never played in a stadium like Stockport County, so that would be miles ahead of where I am right now. So I would put that as my favorite stadium too. Um, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I can imagine it's a fantastic stadium. I'll have to look it up after this to see what it looks like. And obviously, like you said, the story of what you were able to do in that stadium definitely yeah. adds and to it. it. It's, not like the, it's not like how big the stadium was. or, or Sentimental like, uh, value. All that stuff. It was like the way I felt on the yeah. field in that stadium for some reason was different from everywhere else I played. Yeah, that's so yeah. cool. Well, yeah. the last two questions that uh, we want to ask. The first one is, and we're asking these uh, with everyone. The first one is related to our mission. So our mission, I can read it off to you and also for anyone listening. Yeah. Our mission is to create a community of passionate football fans who highlight the classy side of the game, keeping discussion positive, uplifting, and inspirational. Now, this is a new mission that we have developed as of season four, which is when people are listening to this, it'll be released now, but while we're recording this, it's releasing in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah. And so as a podcast trying to create a positive and uplifting community, what advice do you have for us or our fans um, to help the footballing world become a better place? Um, to become a better place, I think uh, the environment we had at Kevin Drude's, like it, <laughs> you're, you're all part of it together, right? When yep. things are going good, when things are being bad, like support your team, um, and like stand behind the players, the coach, the club. Um, it goes a long, long way. And yeah, what else? What else? I'm a huge fan of good deeds and just doing nice things for people. So if you can actually take all the fans in a city and like get them to do nice things to get for to each other, do nice things for the community. Um, I think it's massive. So yeah try to do nice things and, and support your team in, you know, when they're, things are going well and when, when they're not. Yeah. Wonderful. And then finally, uh, just to close it out, why do we play football? Why do we play do soccer? We play football? Um, why do we play? Brings people together. Love it. That's a beautiful answer. Thank you so much for coming on Cody. It was absolutely fantastic to have you on and to hear all of your stories about how hard you work, all the teams you've bounced around between. And I mean, your crazy story, just injuries, different teams, working three training sessions a day, playing poker to keep traveling around to find different surgeons to possibly do your surgery. I mean, it's a crazy story. Anyone who got to listen to this will definitely have their day blessed and be able to take something away from it. So thank you so much for being able to do this. Um, and we would love to have you on again sometime soon uh, in the future if you have any other stories to share with us. So uh, thank you so much, and we hope you have a great day. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Have a great right. day. Yeah. Yep. Thanks, guys.